initially a startup and getting the systems into place. Um, then we went through a merger to bring in about 1,300 scientists from two of our founding partners, um, the MRC and Cancer Research UK. So actually then we had to get that done successfully to integrate them into one structural organisation. And then finally there was the migration into the new building. So at all of those stages we had goals that we had to achieve um, and there was a very clear idea of what success was going to be. I think also there was a need for flexibility um, because the building was delivered late, building projects are not that atypical, um, and so motivating the team and keeping them focused during a period of uncertainty when we didn't quite know when we were going to be moving and trying to structure plans around that was really important. But yes, I, I think um, the beauty of the Crick was that we have a, a very visible goal and very visible target in terms of the, the new building that we could point to and say, that's kind of what we're delivering. It's an interesting challenge to ensure that IT keeps pace with the scientists. Um, we, do it, we try and do it in a variety of ways. I mean, the main thing is talking to them. So we collaborate very closely with our scientists. We have a specific steering group, our scientific computing steering group where we meet with a number of the scientists on a monthly basis and we talk about what's coming through. We have a, a governance process for actually um, doing resource allocation and so on so that we can understand what's happening. But it is a challenge. Uh, science is moving at such a rate. We were told recently by one of the scientists that he was interested in buying a new microscope and that was capable of generating five petabytes of data a week. Now, given that our total storage is 10 petabytes, which is already considered a lot by a lot of organisations, this would have filled it up in two weeks flat. Um, fortunately, the manufacturer realised that this was not going to be a viable proposition for most organisations, so they, they've gone back to the drawing board. But um, we have kit on site, uh, we have our cryo-electron microscopes that each generate about two terabytes of data a night. So it's, uh, yeah, we, we can, the Crick as a whole, at the moment has a baseline data generation capability from instruments of about 20 terabytes a day. So keeping pace with that, I mean, we, we can at the moment, but we do have to make sure that we are constantly in the loop with the scientists about what they're planning to buy and where science is going and where, where the next thing is going to be. But yeah, that, that's a big driver. I think they do understand the limitations of the Crips of charity, so we haven't got bottomless pockets for, for buying this stuff. Um, and they're, they're certainly aware of the limitations. Um, and to some degree sympathetic to them but obviously for them their first priority is the science so yeah, they, they are sympathetic but they still want us to deliver in, in some way so it's, it's a constant dialogue. Uh, the other area is graphics processing in its GPUs for machine learning um, and that's an area where we haven't at the moment got um, capability but we're just building it into our cluster so we have individual scientists working on GPU workstations but that's not really cost effective for the organisation as a whole so we want to provide that as a service centrally for, for the organisation to be able to do more machine learning. But we've got a, a baseline data generation capacity of about 20 terabytes a day. So we've had to do all of these calculations to try and understand what the sustainable data growth really looks like for the CRIC because as a charity it matters and it, it, we can't have it all grow out of the park. Um, it means doing data management so that 10 petabytes of storage gives us about a year's worth of data, allowing for headroom and so on. Um, then we will need to have archiving, which is why we're looking at that at the moment. So we've, we've got our high availability storage, we've got capacity in that, but then we need to be able to archive off into cheaper and cheaper storage. So tiered archiving is, is what we're looking at at the moment, and providing those next tiers. Um, like everyone, we have a retention policy around our data, so we have to keep it for a period, but doing data management and looking at how we can compress it, how we can encourage people to delete data over time, is going to be really important in how we can get to that story of a sustainable cost for data, big data at the break. I have real difficulty defining the CIO role because I, d I don't think there is a CIO role as such. I, I think CIOs, and I was reflecting on this recently, are very much situational. So my own career not intentionally, but certainly when I look back, has been very much about going into organisations either into greenfield developments like the Crick or into troubleshoot things. And that seems to be where I find my personal sweet spot. 
but I think there are different CIOs are right for different organisations at different points in time. So I think one of the important things as a CIO is to actually understand how you fit. It's like Churchill being a very good war prime minister, but less good as a peacetime prime minister. That, that seems to be the, the accepted wisdom. Um, and I think that's probably true of CIOs as well. So I don't think it's about a one-size-fits-all description of the CIO role. It's about understanding your particular skills and how they fit to the organisation. So you see a lot of organisations now, CIOs now, who are becoming very much more than the CIO role and then going into business activities and, and I have had those opportunities as well and I like that. Um, but that has to be if the organisation is open to that transformation. If the organisation is not particularly transformational then the last thing they need is a transformational CIO.